and greeting saints the most high and welcome to the messianic tour observer i'm rod thomas and i want to thank you for taking the time from your busy schedules to fellowship with me here on this blessed day of rest for it is here that we gather every Shabbat to delve into Jehovah's eternal words of life, his instructions and in righteousness, which happens to be our constitution and the very foundation for our covenant relationship with the creator of the universe. And as always, beloved, it is our hope, it's our trust, and it's our prayer that this installment of the Messianic Torah Observer finds you, your families, and fellowships well and blessed. This is finding peace with God, eternal life, and a blessed assurance. This is a continuation of our Paul and Hebrew Roots mega series where we've been discussing some of the more challenging, hard to understand Pauline writings. And we've been spending most of our time over the past year or more in the book of Romans. Our focus passage for this discussion is found in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And it reads as follows, and this is the King James Version modified rendering. Verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, and we've been talking a lot about that, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. God with Yah through our master Yeshua Messiah. Verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of Yah. Verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience. In verse 4, and patience, experience, and experience, hope. And lastly, verse 5, and hope makes not a shame, because the love of Yah is shed abroad in the hearts by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. Again, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, after reading or hearing for that matter these five verses that there's really nothing too difficult or challenging to understand here and to a greater and lesser extent i would certainly agree with you but in my studies of this section of the apostles letter to the roman messianics this week i found shaul paul's perspective on the topic or the issue of peace or in Hebrew, shalom with God, with Yah, to be quite unique and interesting. And I wanted to share those thoughts with you before moving on to other bona fide, hard to understand Pauline passages. Not to mention, there are varying opinions and perspectives on what the peace of Yah, the shalom of Yah means and looks like, and how one is supposed to receive that peace. And so, we need to discuss and attempt to understand these critical spiritual things which powerfully impacts each of our respective walks and in and with Messiah. So let's proceed to break down and discuss each verse of our focus passage along with exploring the prospects of peace or shalom with Yah from a practical, a halakhic standpoint. Verse 1, let us continue to have peace. The apostle writes, let us continue to have peace or shalom. Shalom meaning, of course, peace, integrity though, wholeness, which is the main thing is this wholeness of well-being, this wholeness of health, an existence or a state of wholeness. And this is really put forth this idea of let us continue to have shalom in Howard Stern's, I'm sorry, not Howard Stern. 
<laughs> Mr. Stearns, I don't, I don't recall his name. I'm sorry, I messed that up. His name is not the, that I will never mention that name again. But Mr. Stearns' Complete Jewish Bible rendering, that was a slip that I am so sorry to put forth. But Stearns' Complete Jewish Bible translation. And while other manuscripts read, we have shalom or we have peace with Yah, the rendering of let us continue according to Messianic author and commentator J.K. McKee, seems to flow better with verses 2 and 3, whereby, as a byproduct of the peace we enjoy with Yah, our peace places us in a position where we may, in verse 2, rejoice in the hope of Yah's glory, and 3, rejoice in our sufferings. Why would anyone rejoice in their sufferings? Isn't that kind of counterintuitive? Indeed it is. Well, when we realize and understand the full extent of the peace we have in Yah, we know that our redemption and our restoration is right ahead of us. And the sufferings that we must endure in this life, instead of those sufferings and troubles destroying and damaging us, when they're taken within glorious context of our peace with Yah, they produce in us endurance or patience. And despite the fact that this life is temporal, it's temporary, we know that, like our Master Yeshua, we will be raised to a life that is eternal with Father Yah. Romans chapter 6, verse 5. And the New English translation reads, For if we have become united with him, the him being Yeshua, if we have become united with Yeshua in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be united in the likeness of his resurrection. Praise Yah and Amen and Amen. Yes, indeed. Now, those of you who've been with us for any appreciable length of time will know that we've gone over the role of faith as it relates to one's salvation quite a bit over the last oh, half year or so, even more so. And by the way, if by chance you are new to TMTO, the Messianic Tour Observer, we would humbly encourage you to go on over to the website, the Messianic Tour Observer, and simply go through the last oh, dozen or so installments of this program where we go into detail about the roles of faith and obedience, the roles that these two things, these two crucial concepts in our faith must play in the life of the note serene, the life of the note sorry or the messianic. And so the apostle begins this portion of his letter to the Roman Messianic Assembly by reiterating the central truth that one is justified, one is reckoned righteous by Yah through a trusting faith in the person and ministry of Yeshua Messiah. And he then proceeds to connect to this central truth of one's trusting faith resulting in him or her being reckoned righteous by Father Yah to him or her then having peace with Yah, or existing or being in a state of shalom or peace with Father Yah. Prior to one coming into a faithful, obedient covenant relationship with Yah, he or she exists in a perpetual state of hostility towards and war against Father Yah. Shaul describes this state of being at odds with Yah as being hostile to or in enmity against him, against Father Yah. Why? Because the unconverted mind in the unconverted mind in the Greek is phronema, phronema, which means that which one has in their mind or in their thoughts or their intentions to do. Well, that unconverted mind and unconverted heart is on its own 
incapable of submitting to the law or rule of Yah. Romans chapter 8, verse 7. The unconverted mind and heart needs help. It needs a helping hand, and Yah is the one who does the heavy lifting in that respect. And we'll talk a little more about that in just a moment. But this inability, this incapability to overcome that enmity against or that hostility toward Yah and his ways comes only through the one repenting of his or her life of sin, asking Father Yah for his forgiveness, and then entering into a faithful, trusting relationship with Yah through Yeshua Messiah. So as I just mentioned, Father Father Yah does the heavy lifting here as it relates to the elimination of the state or that state of hostility and war that exists between Yah and his human creation. And the heavy lifting he does is that of providing humanity the means by which it can be at peace with him, since on its own it is incapable of reconciling with and being at peace with Father Yah. Consequently, there must be an acceptable and an effective intercessor or mediator to bring about that peace. And that acceptable and effective intercessor or mediator, of course, is none other than our master, Yeshua Messiah. Now, for the portion of humanity that is not reconciled or brought to peace with their creator, they remain as sons and children of wrath. Sons and children of wrath, that is, those who are subject to Yah's wrathful judgment. In order to have true communion and a true relationship with the Almighty, there must be a reconciliation between Yah and the son or child of wrath. Speaking to the Ephesian Messianic Assembly, Shaul wrote the following. Chapter 2 verses 1 through 3, and the New English translation reads as follows. Verse 1, and although you were dead in your transgressions and sins, verse 2, in which you formerly lived according to this world's present path, according to the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the ruler of the spirit that is now energizing the sons of disobedience, Verse 3, among whom all of us also formerly lived out our lives in the cravings of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature, what? Children of wrath, even as the rest. Children of wrath are children of disobedience. They're one and the same. But disobedience to what? Well, disobedience to Yah's way of life that he has ordained for his human creation. Yah's instructions in righteousness. Yah's words of life. But wait a minute. I thought according to the denominationalist, obedience to Yah's ways, obedience to his instructions in righteousness were not required for Yah's people. Why? Because Paul wrote that we are saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves, and that salvation is a gift of Yah. And that man's works, and they interpret works erroneously as obedience to Yah's Torah. Works is Yah's doing Yah's will, doing Yah's Torah, living and walking in Yah's Torah, and that that work, those works, have no part in a believer's life. And this is a reference again to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. But here, Shaul clearly refers to his Ephesian readers before their coming to faith as being sons of disobedience. Now that's in verse 2, and later on we see, he repeats it in chapter 5, verse 6. The situation that the apostle is describing there in Ephesians 2 is that of humanity 
falling into two distinct exclusive classes. And the first class is, are, involves or consists of those who are obedient to this world, obedient to this world and its ways, and who are disobedient to the way of life that Yah ordained for his human creation to walk out in. And the other class is consists of those who are obedient to Yah's exclusive way of life and who turn away and are dead to those old ways, dead to the flesh, dead to the enemy's ways and his rulings over their lives. So there are only two classes of souls in the world, according to way Shaul states this, and I totally agree with it. And there is no crossover or middle ground. We find in James, Yaakov, the following. Chapter 2, verses 20 and 26, that faith without works is dead. Unfortunately, we have a great many folks claiming Yeshua as their Savior, but who refuse to be obedient to Yah's instructions and righteousness. What did Yeshua say? If you love me, keep my commandments? Whoa, 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 whoa. I thought you just said that there, we don't have to do anything. And Yeshua's commandments, by the way, his father's ways of his instructions and in righteousness. It's the same. He got everything he taught and preached about from his father. So it's the same instructions that father gave in his Torah. Well, according to these Pauline passages, these folks fall into the category, those who um, refuse to obey Yah's instructions and in righteousness, well, they fall into the category of sons or children of disobedience. Why? They have Yah's instructions in righteousness. And they have the teachings of Yeshua Messiah that are accessible to them in their 66 special or their Bibles, to use the common knowledge parlance. And, uh, and they have also in today, in 2022, tons of resources and helps to facilitate their understanding and the applicability of those instructions in righteousness. So there's no excuse. However, as we saw manifested through the Hebrew ancients, through their lives, that there exists a stiff-necked spirit that controls the minds and hearts of the modern Jew and the denominationalist. They're both stubborn. They both resist keeping Yah's instructions in righteousness. They resist being obedient to Yah, conforming to his way of life. And sadly, these simply do not want to conform to Yah's righteous ways. And consequently, children or sons of disobedience are subject to Yah's wrath. Again, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6, throw in Colossians chapter 3, verse 6, and in particular, in particular, read the whole chapter of Romans 1, in particular, verse 18 and you'll see what we're talking about and we'll see that Shaul is really concerned about this thing. Back in the day, Yah instituted in his Torah the required ritual of the peace offering and this is all laid out in Leviticus or Vayikra chapter 3 verses 1 through 9. Now the peace offering or peace sacrifices and the Hebrew term for offering is carbonot. And the peace offering itself in Hebrew is zabak shalamin. Zabak shalamin, where you can see that the shalamin is a derivative of shalom. One and the same almost. So Yah instructed his people to submit unto him peace offerings and sacrifices for the purpose of showing their thanks and gratitude for the work that he, Yah, had done in their lives. Such offerings consisted of a perfect yearly, yearling, yearling lamb, 
goat, or calf. And these sacrifices were to be volitional in nature. Volitional meaning voluntary or of one's free will. Y'all's not forcing anybody to do anything. If you don't want to be at peace with y'all, then don't give the offering. If you just want to fly by the seat of your pants and hope you can get past y'all by acting a fool in your life, gambling with your eternal security, then have at it, Father says. This is a voluntary, a volitional offering this peace offering as well as this peace offerings had an element of vicariousness attached to it vicarious in nature. That is that the animal's death represented that of the offerer. So that animal stood in substitution of that offender or offerer. And so the blood of that, offering that animal would be drawn from these sacrifices uh, and from these animals and splashed on the sides of the brazen altar and a portion of the animal itself the slain animal was to be burnt upon the brazen altar a burnt offering and then a second portion was to be consumed by the servicing Kohanim or the Levitical priest and lastly the remaining portion was to be consumed by the offerer and his family now this sacrifice this offering the peace offering clearly points to our master Yeshua Messiah as the intercessor and facilitator of the peace that we now enjoy with the creator of the universe. The prophet Yeshayahu, Isaiah, foretold of the peace inducing role that our master Yeshua would play in Yah's plan of salvation, redemption, and restoration. Chapter 9, verse 6, and the King James Version reads, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and here it is, the Prince of Peace. Here, Yeshayahu Isaiah identifies the prophesied Messiah, Yeshua, as the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Shalom, which certainly screams of Yeshua being the facilitator and mediator of a permanent peace that he would usher in between his father and those whom his father chooses to be his sons and daughters. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, from the very beginning, Father Yah has desired, has yearned to have a true and substantive relationship with his human creation. That is, for humanity to commune with him. He's always wanted this, but that substantive relationship would not be possible unless the hostility, the state of war that is brought about by a life of sin, that sin nature, that impenetrable barrier that exists between Yah and humanity, unless somehow that barrier was eliminated. And in the days when Torah was being communicated was being passed down to our ancient cousins, Yisrael, Yah had not enacted the final solution to eliminate that hostility and perpetual state of war that exists between Yah and humanity. But rather, in the interim, Yah enacted those temporary fixes to the hostility. And those temporary fixes were in the form of burnt and peace offerings. Thus, when an offender or an offerer sought to make amends with Yah, he or she would offer peace offerings and sacrifices. And if accepted, if accepted by Yah, the offender would temporarily exist in a state of peace with Yah until the offender again broke covenant. 
sinned or transgressed Torah or offended Yah. And when the offender broke covenant, sinned or offended Yah, he or she would have to what? Repeat those sacrifices and burnt offerings. And this proves to be a perpetual, lifelong, repeated process of making amends with Yah through Father's sanctioned offerings and sacrifices. And just as it was with our ancient wandering cousins, it was impossible for humanity to be right before Yah without the appropriate offerings and sacrifices and a repentant and a repentant and sorrowful heart. Psalm chapter 34, verse 18, and chapter 51, verse 17, and Isaiah chapter 57, verses 15, and chapter 66, verse 2. Otherwise, our ancient cousins would remain in a state of hostility and enmity towards Yah. Similarly, we today cannot be in a right substantive relationship with Yah without Yeshua, who is our vicarious substitute, our intercessor, our mediator, and without a circumcised heart that seeks first the kingdom of Yah and his righteousness. Now, let me just inter interject here that it, a lot of people just felt that you had to go through the process of the burnt offerings and the peace offerings and all of these things, and you'll be right with Yah. But Yah is a reader of the heart. And if your heart wasn't right, if you didn't have a circumcised heart, although you may have been physically circumcised, if you didn't have the right heart and mind and intent while offering those circumcised, uh, so, while offering, I'm sorry, those offerings, those burnt offerings and peace offerings and such, if you didn't possess that, you weren't right with Father. People just go through the motions even today, especially in our faith community. What do they do? They go through the motions. They keep the Sabbath. They eat, uh, they eat clean. They keep the holy days. They go through the motions of keeping the moral laws, but their heart isn't right toward Yah. And if your heart is not right towards Yah, what do I mean by heart not right towards Yah? You're not willing to bend to his sovereignty and rulership over your life. If you're not willing to die to yourself and live unto him, give up the world, give up your bad habits, give up those things that are not of Yah in your life, and then walk out before him as he directs your steps. Then if you don't do that, then your heart is not right. You're being resistant. And many of us come into this faith with that baggage of being stiff-necked, stubborn, and unwilling to bend to Yah's will. We have to bend to Yah's will in addition to attaching ourselves vicariously and volitionally to the sanctioned sacrifices that Yah has put in place. And for us today, it's the person and ministry of Yeshua Messiah that makes that relationship that we want with Yah, that Yah wants with us, possible. Amen. Amen. I just wanted to interject that. Now, in light of what we've been discussing so far, what did the apostle mean by the phrase, we have peace with God? <clears throat> we have shalom with Yah. Sip of coffee here to kind of lubricate. I got a little frog in my voice today, and I apologize for that. I've had it for a couple days. Not sure what it's about. Could be allergies and all. We have a high pollen count here in North Texas these days. And it has been uh, kind of uh, taking its toll on me a little bit. But I feel great. Y'all's good. And I am happy to be here talking with you today. So we'll just keep going. And I'll keep lubricating and uh, dealing with that frog in my voice with sips of my coffee here. Well, according to Messianic Torah scholar and commentator Tim Haig of 
the Torah resources. As far as Paul, Shaul is concerned here in our focus passage, quote, being at peace with Yah has less to do with the subjective feelings we might have about our relationship with the Almighty. That is our being in possession of a blessed assurance that we are in communion with Yah. But more so, it has to do with an objective state of being at peace as opposed to being enemies with Yah or against Yah, end quote. And that was Tim Haig's Romans or the Book of Romans commentary. It is the person and ministry of Yeshua Messiah who enacts, who facilitates, who mediates this peace that comes to a would-be child of Yah. So the one who enters a life of peace with Yah is no longer viewed by Yah as a child of disobedience or a child of wrath, but rather a reconciled child of his, a child of obedience. Romans chapter 5. And the first part of verse 10 reads, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to Yah through the death of his son. Amen. Whether unredeemed humanity chooses to admit it or not, it inherently knows that a state of hostility exists between it and its creator. This inherent knowledge of Yah and Yah's embedded moral constitution is found in every rational being. We spoke extensively about this in previous installments to TMTO. Shaul wrote extensively about this in Romans chapter 1 verses 18 through 32. And we broke down this passage in our post entitled, What Did Paul Mean by Being Under the Law? And I would encourage you, if you've not already done so, to either read or listen to that post as you are so led. Now, the peace that exists between the covenant keeping note, sorry, or messianic and Yah is not enacted or arrived at through obedience to Torah. It is enacted or arrived at strictly through faith in the person and ministries of Yeshua Messiah. This new state of peace that note Sarim or messianics enjoy completely eliminates the animus or state of enmity that he or she once walked or lived in. This former enemy or enmity state of being was the thing that was in essence nailed to the execution stake along with our master Yeshua Messiah. Colossians chapter 2. Verses 13 and 14, and the KJV reads, And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. You see, it was our trespasses, it was our sins, it was our contrary way of life that brought about our enemy or enmity status. Continuing with verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, that is the bill of charges against us, uh, the certificate of indebtedness, the record of charges that was against us, which was contrary to us, which was hostile towards us, and took it out of the way. Father took it out of the way, nailing it to Yeshua's cross. You see, Yah will not commune with those who are in a state of opposition and hostility towards him. Would you want to have friends or be friends or to have a relationship with people who can't stand you? With people who don't have your same values? Who don't agree with you? Who think differently than you? There are people out there that are willing to compromise and 
just for whatever reason, whether it benefits them or something or they have some weirdness about them, they will befriend people who are unequally yoked to them, who don't share their same moral standards. And this all makes perfect sense that Father won't commune with those who are in enmity towards him, who are in a state of war with him. Uh, it makes sense in light of what the prophet Amos wrote. Chapter 3, verse 3. The prophet reasons can two walk together except they be agreed. My gosh, that's it's, it's just such, such a short verse, and yet it has volumes being said here. Shaul linked such a re, uh, re, relational situation to that of being unequally yoked. Being unequally yoked. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, in the KJV reads, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? My goodness, can you say it any stronger than this? Although Shaul is contextually addressing discord between brethren and outsiders to the faith in his second letter to the Corinthians, the same principle certainly applies to a potential relationship between Yah and his human creation. For true peace and a personal relationship to exist between Father Yah and his would-be son or daughter, well, he or she, that son and daughter, must think and act like Yah. They must be in a state of righteousness that is acceptable to Yah. And that state of righteousness comes only through faith in Yeshua Messiah. The would-be child of Yah must be walking in the ways of of life and of light, not in the ways of the world and in the ways of darkness. Otherwise, he or she will remain in a persistent state of enmity and hostility towards Yah. And that state of enmity and hostility makes him or her subject to Yah's wrath and judgment. Shaul continues in our focus passage. Verse 2, through whom the whom being Yeshua Messiah here, through Yeshua we have also obtained access by faith, our trusting, faith being Yah's loving kindness and favor in which we presently stand and we rejoice in the hope of Yah's glory. Yah's unmerited grace, or his unmerited favor, if you will, comes only through Yeshua. Master said, and this is recorded in John or Yochan in chapter 10, verse 9, that he was the door and that by him, if any man enters in, that is, enters into Yah's glory via his grace, he shall be saved and he shall go in and out and find pasture. Pasture is in essence, find pasture peace. He'll find that peace with Yah that he once did not have because formerly he was a child of disobedience, a child of wrath. He was in a state of war with father and in a state of enmity. But if you go through Yeshua with faith, you will find that state of enmity and war dissolved, and you will be in a state of shalom with Yah, the creator of the universe. And then we find in John, same book, chapter 14, verse 6, where Master says that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father. No one can establish a relationship with my Father this is Yeshua speaking, unless you come through me first, you have to go through me. There's no other way. You have to have faith in my person and in my ministry. And then, 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 then there will be peace between my father and you. 
So I trust you see the direct connection that exists here between Yah's grace and Yah's peace. The peace that we as a child of Yah enjoys is a direct result of Yah's grace that he pours out upon us in response to our trusting faith in the person and ministry of his son, Yeshua, our master. And so the one reckoned righteous before a holy and righteous Elohim exists or stands in perfect peace with and before Father Yah. That faithful, peaceful existence we have with Yah through Yeshua provides us access to Yah, access to the creator of the universe. So we no longer need or require a Kohen, a Kohanim or Levitical priest to intercede or mediate on our behalf in order for us to have access to Father Yah. For the veil in the temple was indeed rent from the top to the bottom when Yeshua died on the execution stake on our behalf. Matthew chapter 27, verse 51. According to Messianic author and commentator J.K. McKee, our English term access, as used in this verse, is prosagoge, which is used in the Tanakh to describe one's turning aside to gain access to something, such as found, for instance, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 4, where Yah sees Moses, has turned aside or turned toward the burning, the miracle of the burning bush. And so now Moses has access, prosagoge, to him. He is given access to his presence in that situation. Exodus chapter 3, verse 4. And so this very exclusive access, and Yah has to be the one to grant the access. We don't just bu budge in and think we can have access to Yah because many people in our faith and outside our faith believe that they set the rules and they're going to force a relationship with Yah. They're going to force their way in and get have direct access to Yah. But Father says, hold on a minute. I'm in charge. I'm the one who grants the access and I grant that access by you conforming to my will and doing that which I instruct you to do. And so this very exclusive access to y'all that we enjoy as fathers redeemed chosen ones set apart ones is a benefit that we absolutely should rejoice over. But then Shaul, in the same verse, verse 2, declares unto his Roman Messianic Jewish audience that this peaceful, faithful covenant relationship is the very thing that they should rejoice about as opposed to their rejoicing about their Jewishness. Bear in mind, beloved, this is all connected contextually with the apostles' overall messaging to the Roman Messianic assembly members most of whom, if you recall, were Messianic Jews with a powerfully influential grouping of Judaizers or influencers. C.E.B. Cranfield. Cranfield was a 30-year theological professor at the University of Durham, and he writes about this access issue, this thing that we're talking about. And he writes, um, and, and, and actually this is pulled from, or I pulled it from Tim Haig's book on, uh, or his commentary on the book of Romans. And he quotes Cranfield here. And I want to share this quote with you because it's so spot on. And Haig quotes Cranfield as follows, quote, whereas between human judge and an accused person, listen closely here or read closely, whereas between human judge and an accused person, there may be no real deep personal relationship at all. 
the relationship between God and the sinner is altogether personal. <laughs> Both because God is the God he is, and also because it is against God himself that the sinner has sinned. So God's justification of sinners by necessity involves also their reconciliation, the removal of enmity, the establishment of peace, end quote. Therefore, the apostle asserts that the child of Yah not only has their peaceful standing with Yah to rejoice in, but also their eternal destination or salvation, Yah's glory, Messiah's return, the coming kingdom of Yah, all to rejoice about in connection to shalom with Yah, shalom with Father Yah. We find this sentiment expressed in the writing of the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah, chapter five, uh, chapter nine. I'm sorry, verses twenty three and twenty four. And the New English translation reads as follows: Father Yah says, "Wise people, <laughs> this is so good." <laughs> Father Yah says, "Wise people should not boast that they are wise." Powerful people should not boast that they are powerful. Rich people should not boast that they are rich. Verse 24. If people want to boast or rejoice, they should rejoice or boast about this. They should rejoice that they understand and they know me. Wow. They should boast or rejoice that they know and understand that I Yehovah, Yahweh, Yahuwah, however you declare his name, that I act out of faithfulness, out of fairness, out of justice in the earth, and that I desire people to do these things, says Yah. The peace of Yah, in a sense, can also be viewed as a down payment or token of the future glory that we will possess when master returns and we are instantly changed and transformed and wrapped in father's dazzling glory. First Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 through 54 in the KJV rendering reads as such, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be all changed. Verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Verse 53. Because this corruptible, well, must first put on incorruption. And this mortal, well, must put on immortality. Verse 54, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, woe, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. As it relates to the hope of Yah's glory, many within and outside our faith community, and me included, believe that before the fall, Adam and Eve radiated Yah's glory, that Yah provided them a source of light that clothed them and radiated from their bodies. So I ask you, could this glory that Shaul alludes to here in verse 2 of our focus passage which is derived from the peace that Yah's people are granted because of their faith in Yeshua, could it be a passing mention of Yah's chosen ones receiving that dazzling radiance, Yah's radiant glory to be restored to them in the coming kingdom? And the answer to that question is indeed yes. For our master makes mention of that lost radiance himself 
that radiance being restored to his bride when he returns and establishes his kingdom. Matthew chapter 13, verse 43. And the New English translation reads, Then the righteous, that's us, yes. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. I used to just read past that and think it was just beautiful, poetic stuff. But man, when you consider that before the fall that Adam and Eve were clothed in light, I'm not hard and fast on that, but that's what I believe. And we hear of visions of and images of our risen Savior being clothed and radiating this dazzling light and that when we are resurrected and we are translated and we meet our master face to face we're going to have that same dazzling glory wow will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father if that doesn't make you jump and shout for shout hallelujah, praise Yah, I don't know what will. And he ends this with the one who has ears had better listen. Because you don't want to miss this, beloved. You don't want to miss this opportunity. You have no idea, he's saying, what you are going to get when you get to the kingdom. It is amazing, and I has not seen nor ear heard of those great things that are in store for his beloved. And this is a reference, this issue of the dazzling brilliance and radiance of our Father being bestowed upon his chosen ones. This is drawn from the prophet Daniel, who writes in chapter 12, verse 3 of his book, and they that be wise shall what shine as the brightness of the firmament. This is two witnesses, brethren, two witnesses to this dazzling glory of light that we will reflect in the kingdom to come. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever beloved what an amazing promise this is this is indeed something to rejoice about wouldn't you agree but then in verse three <laughs> the brakes are put on in verse three of our focus passage of romans chapter five verse three the apostle throws his readers somewhat of a curveball as it relates to the called out one's peace with yah he writes not only this, but we also rejoice in sufferings. Knowing that now this is right on the hindsight of him saying we rejoice because of our access to father and the peace we have with father. But now he's saying we also rejoice when we suffer. What? Knowing that suffering produces what endurance and for endurance character and character hope clearly the called out ones of y'all have a lot of positive things to rejoice about they have an abiding peace with y'all they have salvation they have a faithful covenant relationship with the creator and access to y'all's favor his grace but who in their right mind would ever fathom the blessed called out ones tribute rejoicing in their troubles their tribulations their afflictions and such for this reality is completely counterintuitive to that which we've all been raised to understand as it relates to when and why we rejoice you see the world has taught us that we are to celebrate the good things that happen to us during our lives conversely that we are to lament or to be saddened by the bad things that happen to us in life. But the kingdom economy, 
What I mean by kingdom economy, the way that the kingdom works or operates, well, it naturally runs contrary to that of the world's economy, the way the world works. As we rejoice in the wonderfully good things that happen to us in this life, we also, we as Yah's set apart people, rejoice at the bad or negative things that happen to us throughout our walk with Messiah. Now, since we're hardwired, almost from birth, to be sad and mournful about the negatives that overtake us in life, how do we overcome that natural negative reaction to adversity? How are we to rejoice in adversity or tribulations or troubles? Simply this, beloved. We apply that same faith, that Abraham-level faith, that is presently saving us and presently making us righteous before Yah. We apply that trusting faith to those sufferings, those afflictions, those troubles. We trust that Yah will take us through and deliver us from those problems. And because we believe this, we can rejoice in our adversities, our troubles, and our sufferings. Another way of looking at this is for us to stop focusing on or looking at that situation or thing that is causing us problems, but rather or instead turn our attention and focus entirely upon Yah and his keeping and saving power. Refocus our attention. Don't look at our woes and our problems and our troubles. Look at Yah. It's hard to do. I know it is. But if you lean on the Holy Spirit operating in your life, you can do it. Anything is possible with Yah, he says. So then, as you can see, our faithful, peaceful existence in Yah is tied directly to our being in a position to rejoice in whatever sufferings may come our way. And oh, by the way, beloved, this concept of rejoicing in our sufferings it's not a Brit Hadashah. It's not a New Testament concept. <laughs> because we find in Midrash Takuma, and the Midrash Takuma is a collection of Torah, Midrashim, and Agadot, um, non legalistic rabbinic exegesis or study. Uh, it's a collection of rabbinic text and folklore, historical anecdotes and moral exhortations, and blah, 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 blah. Well, we find in Takuma the following eye opening text related to what we're talking about here. It reads To him who gives thanks for his afflictions and rejoices over them. Woo! God grants life in this world and in the world to come. Life without end. For a lamp are the commandments and the Torah is light. And this is a reference to Proverbs chapter 6 verse 23. And the rabbi continues, why then did Moses merit that his countenance should shine? Even in this world, with a light destined for the righteous in the next world. Because he was ever striving, yearning, watching to establish peace between Yisrael and their father in heaven. Beloved, don't misunderstand what I'm doing here when I introduce these rabbinic writings to you. I'm not encouraging anybody to follow the teachings and ways of the rabbis or Orthodox Judaism. What I do with these, my intent in introducing these to you is to give you an understanding, a perspective of how the ancient Jewish mind worked, how they saw things, and often how they saw things and how they worked through those things and how they conducted themselves was contrary to Torah. I'll admit that. Absolutely, they were bad. They were presumptive. But 
from time to time as we see here in the Midrash Takuma. They're spot on. They, they hit on some very key principal spiritual matters. And we can learn from them. We can learn as, as long as we have eyes to see and ears to hear and can discern right from wrong, holy from the unholy or impure, that which is of Yah and that which is of man. If we can discern that, if we can eat chicken and spit out the bones, eat the meat and spit out the bones, we can certainly reference these things and learn from them. That's what this is all about. This is not replacing Torah. This is not replacing the Tanakh. This is not replacing the teachings of Yeshua and the Brit Hadashah writings. These are just resources that we look back at because whether or not we want to agree with it or not, whether we want to agree with it, our ancient Jewish cousins and even our modern day Jewish cousins uh, were still linked we're still linked. We haven't, we who are under the renewed covenant haven't replaced any of our Jewish cousins or brothers. Yah is going to work with them. Yah is going to deal with them. He has the covenant with them. We're just engrafted into that commonwealth of Yisrael. We're, we're catching a ride with them to the kingdom. Many of them aren't going to make it into the kingdom, but some of the righteous remnant will. And Yah's going to open their eyes. And Yah's going to soften their hearts, and they are going to come to realize the error of their ways. But I'm getting off track. I just wanted you to understand where and why I'm coming to you with these things. So, early rabbinic thinking as it relates to Yah's people rejoicing in their afflictions well, it was a known commodity and reality of Yah's chosen ones. And the primary difference for those of us who are under the renewed covenant and our often wayward Jewish cousins is that the Orthodox Jew felt that God's people should rejoice in sufferings. Why? Because God from time to time causes his people to suffer. Suffering comes from God. That's an interesting way to put it. But we, on the other hand, place our trust in our faithful, obedient covenant relationship with Yah to take us through and deliver us from any and all afflictions that come our way. And so we, in the process of our trusting in Yah's delivering and saving power, well, we rejoice. We even rejoice in our sufferings. It could be positively said of the rabbi's view of rejoicing in one's affliction that the suffering is meant to produce godly qualities in the child of Yah. One, it produces endurance, patience, steadfastness, constancy, all of which is vital to the maintenance of our covenant relationship with Yah. This is spelled out in verse 3. Two, it builds character or experience, which not only helps us navigate through our redeemed life, our life of redemption and restoration and salvation, but also means that we are to come alongside and help a brother or a sister who is in need of sound godly counsel in their particular walk with Messiah, their respective walk with Messiah. Verse four. And three, Hope and expectation is developed in us, which is that thing that gives us a sense of purpose each day in our walk. To expect not just the covenant promises of Yah to be fulfilled without exception in our lives, but that we make it into the kingdom of Yah, verse 4. This shalom that Shaul writes of extends well beyond the relationship that exists between Father Yah and humanity be that relationship a hostile or peaceful one. Yehoshua's ministry not only made peace between Yah and his human creation possible, it also served to tear down the wall that existed between the Jew and non-Jew. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, 
It reads, for he, the he being Yeshua Messiah, Yeshua is our peace, the one who made both groups into one. What groups is he talking about here? He's talking about the true remnant believing Jew and the believing non-Jew. So Yeshua is our peace, the one, and he makes both the believing Jew and the believing non-Jew into one. And he destroyed the middle wall of partition, the hostility when he nullified in his flesh the law of commandments and decrees. He did this to create in himself what? One new man, one new body out of two, thus making peace. Let me stop here before I go to verse 16. This is, I don't know how our denominationalist brethren read over this and miss this because they're into this replacement theology thinking that we have replaced the Jew. And so they think that there is no one man out of two. They think they are the one man. The Jew is gone. They've been done away with. And so here we have Paul telling his Ephesian right, uh, readers that no, he's, he's made us one body. One man. Yes, you believing Jew, you believing non-Jew, become one, become one. It's all about unity, unity of the faith. An amazing concept. Verse 16, and to reconcile them both, the believing Jew and the believing non-Jew, in one body to Yah through the Stavros, the execution stake, the cross, by which the hostility has been killed. So then, Father Yah purposed to, one, bring peace between himself and humanity. And this through Yeshua, through Yeshua, he intended to bring peace between himself and humanity and to make one unified body consisting of the remnant, the true believing Jew and the believing non-Jew, both miraculously accomplished task done through the person and ministry of Yeshua Messiah. Praise Yah. Beyond the obvious, what does shalom with Yehovah, Yahweh Yahuwah, look like? Well, we are wise to look back to Torah as our guide. For we find in Father's instructions to Aaron, the high priest in Moses' day, as it relates to the blessings he was to put on his people, the following. Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. Father says, you're going to put this blessing on the people. Jehovah bless you and protect you. Jehovah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Jehovah lift up his countenance upon you and grant you, give you peace, shalom, wholeness. The rabbinic understanding of the peace or the shalom of Father Yah or with Father Yah is intricately linked to the salvation or deliverance that Father Yah brings to his chosen ones, especially in the last days, in the latter days. We see this relationship between Yah's shalom, his peace, and the delivering and salvation of his people throughout the whole of Scripture. Case in point is Isaiah, or Yeshayahu, chapter 52, verse 7. And the KJV modified reads, Oh, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that brings good tidings, that publishes peace, that brings good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, that says unto Zion, your Elohim reigns. Oh, praise Yah. And then in Nahum, chapter 1, verse 15, 
KJV re reads as follows. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that brings good tidings, that publishes peace. O oh, Judah, keep your solemn feast. Mm. <laughs> keep Torah. Obey Torah. Perform your vows. Do that which you have said you're going to do. For the wicked shall no more pass through you. See, when you do these things that I've just told you to do, the wicked won't go through you and mess you up. They won't overtake you. They won't subject you. They won't destroy you. Because why? He is utterly cut off. That is, Judah is delivered from her enemies. Salvation and delivery. Deliverance. That peace is part and parcel. So the association that salvation has with Yah's shalom and his peace should handily serve as a greater understanding of the state of being that we enjoy as Yah's chosen and beloved sons and daughters. Peace of mind. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. And the peace of Father Yah, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Messiah Yeshua. More so, the reality and state of being in a peaceful and substantive relationship with the creator of the universe. In other words, we have a blessed assurance. A peace of mind that comes from our belief and faith that Yeshua's sacrifice has remitted, has paid for, has covered over our sin debt. And that our trust in his atoning sacrifice that is connected with our covenant relationship with Father Yah guarantees us an eternal peaceful existence or state of being. Beloved, we're talking about salvation. We're talking about the child of Yah being saved, redeemed, and delivered from Yah's wrath. Talking about his or her, her receiving and entering his kingdom. Consequently, Yah's true sons and daughters are afforded a foretaste of that future kingdom in their day-to-day -day lives as they live by and walk in their faith. As stipulated in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. And oh, by the way, we're talking about escaping and being delivered from Yah's wrath. Also being delivered from the wrath and tribulation and affliction of man, of Yah's enemies, the things that they do to hurt and harm us. That's not to say that some of us won't undergo some degree of martyrdom or tribulation by the, Yah's enemies, but Yah in the end will deliver us. He will deliver us. And maybe sometimes that place of safety that we've talked about off and on throughout our walk in Messiah may be the grave. As strange as that may sound. So Yah will deliver and protect. Our faith and the resulting peace he or she enjoys from Yah protects us from the wiles of the enemy, as I just mentioned, provides for us, sustains for us, keeps us, teaches us, and so forth. And so when we parcel out or tease out the term peace from a Hebrew sense or Hebrew perspective, we are uniquely talking about the covenant-keeping son and daughter of Yah living in the very best life they could possibly be living in, which is made possible only through the person and ministry of Yeshua Messiah. And no, we're not talking about the son or daughter of Yah living large in terms of the standards of this world, but rather we're talking about living the life abundant that Yeshua promised his disciples in John or Yochan in chapter 10, verse 10. You see, it's about experiencing some of the highlights of that peace that Yah's chosen ones will experience in the kingdom that is coming. It's about having unspeakable joy when the worldly circumstances surrounding Yah's chosen ones would suggest otherwise. First Peter chapter 1, verse 8. 
It's about overcoming the world in the midst of tribulation, as Yeshua said in John chapter 16, verse 33. Yochanan writes, I have told you these things. This is Yeshua speaking. Yeshua says to them, I have told you these things that I've told you here. So that in me, you may have peace. <laughs> because in the world, you have trouble and suffering. But take courage. I have conquered the world. Oh, praise Yah. You see, it's also about experiencing the miraculous in a world that does not believe in the miraculous. And neither do they believe in the things of Yah. John chapter 14, verse 12. I, Yeshua, tell you the solemn truth. The person who believes in me, what? Will perform the miraculous deeds that I am doing and will perform greater deeds than these because I am going to the Father. Why don't we have the miraculous operating routinely in our life? Because our faith is lacking. We should be experiencing miracles often in our walk with Messiah. But many of us aren't. We need to turn this thing around because Master promised us that we will perform the miraculous deeds that he did. We need to get back to that place. The early apostles did. Many of the saints that followed after them experienced those miracles, but then it started to fade away because people's faith faded away with them, with those miracles. You see, the unredeemed world is not entitled to such peace. They're not entitled to the wonderful things that flow from a peaceful, faithful covenant relationship with Yah. Now, in a broader yet messianic sense, the peace of Yah or peace with Yah can also be understood from a restoration or restorative perspective. Let's once again look back to the Tanakh and its Hebraic understanding of shalom or peace. And there we will find that in many instances where the term shalom is mentioned, it is intricately tied or linked to a restoration of Yisrael. We know that Yisrael throughout her history repeatedly broke covenant with Yah. Yet Yah, because of his love for Yisrael, because of his covenant promises, and because of his grace, has promised to restore Yisrael unto himself. That same sentiment of restoration is easily applied to the Notsari, the messianic of today whereby he or she is being engrafted into the commonwealth of Yisrael. And as a result of that engrafting, the note sorry, the messianic will enjoy the innumerable told and untold riches to be rendered unto believing Yisrael when she is finally restored unto Yehovah in his glorious kingdom to come. We, under the auspices of the renewed covenant, are blessed to receive a foretaste of that coming restoration. And finally, Shaul wraps up this section of our Torah read, I'm not our Torah reading, but our focus passage. I'm sorry. I was reading the Torah reading for today. So it's kind of still in my mind. But, but Shaul wraps up this section of our focus passage having the peace of Yah or finding peace with Yah. And he does so by attaching that peace to the Hebrew concept of hope. Hope being the vehicle whereby the restored, redeemed, and delivered child of Yah may experience the love of Yah through the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Shaul writes in verse 5, And hope does not disappoint. Because the love of Yah has been poured out in our hearts through the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. The hope, that expectation that we have embedded within us through 
Yah's Ruach HaKodesh, Yah's Holy Spirit is, in my opinion, multifaceted and multilayered. Because we know that Yah delivers us from our afflictions, our tribulations, sufferings, and troubles, as well as we expect Yah, without reservation, without question, to complete and fulfill every one of those wonderful covenant promises that he gave to Yisrael. And those promises, of course, include the restoration of Yisrael and the advent of his kingdom here on earth alongside the restoration of all things that were lost when Adam fell. For as Shaul mentioned previously in this same letter regarding Yah's promises, let Yah be true, but every man a liar. Chapter 3, verse 4. So then, this is Romans chapter 3, verse 4, I'm sorry. So then that which we expect from Yah is well-founded. And our trusting faith, the very peace we have in Yah and with Yah, certainly supports the understanding that Yah will do what he has promised he'll do. Praise Yah from whom all blessings flow. It turns out that the phrase love of Yah that the apostle uses here in verse 5 and in other parts of his letters <clears throat> can be taken from either an objective or subjective perspective. The objective perspective has our love going up to Yah. That is, we have love for Yah and we express our love to Yah. The subjective perspective, on the other hand, has it where Yah loves us. That is, Yah expresses his love for us, and so his love comes down to us or is poured out upon us. Given that Shaul adds to his explanation of our hope being something we can confidently take to the bank, so to speak, he seems to be expressing or conveying the subjective form of this verse because he says that Yah's love comes to us and is poured out in our heart. The spirit, the ruach, being that which Yah metaphorically pours out onto and into those he chooses, like one would pour water out onto that which requires cleansing and refreshing. And so Yah's love is directly linked to his Holy Spirit, which he gives to his sons and daughters liberally. Yah's love is manifested in his giving of his spirit to his beloved ones. That spirit dwells with and in us. Thus, Yah effectively dwells within us, and in his dwelling within us, he communicates his love and his peace. The indwelling of Yah's spirit in the temple of Yah's elect, that is, our physical bodies, as Shaul describes us in First, Temp uh, First Corinthians, I'm sorry, chapter six, verse nineteen. Well, that indwelling of Yah's spirit serves, in a sense, as a token, as a guarantee, as a down payment that He will complete the work that He has begun in His chosen ones. It becomes the culm the culmination the culmination, the grand outcome being that of reigning with master, that outcome reigning with master Yeshua in his coming and in his kingdom. Praise Yah. And that, my friends, that beloved is certainly something to write home about. So then in closing, in our practical Halakha application to this, peace with Yah. Let us pursue the peace of Yah as we pursue the kingdom of Yah and his righteousness by our living and walking firmly in Avraham level faith as Yah has instructed us to do in Habakkuk chapter two, verse four, the righteous shall live by their faith. The righteous shall live by faith. And let us develop the little faith we currently have, because let's, wonder, let's be honest, let's be, let's be brutally honest, most of us don't have much faith to work with. It's reality, and Father knows it. We're not fooling Father. He knows what we're made of. 
I lack faith in so many areas. I'm, I'm working on it and I'm allowing the spirit to do its work in me, but I can do better. But let us develop that little faith we currently have into that Abraham level faith. That should be our goal each day is to increase our faith such that Yah will eventually consider us his friend as he did with Abraham and as mentioned in James or Yaakov chapter 2 verse 23. And we develop that faith simply by learning about and claiming, even verbally outright claiming Yah's covenant promises. We can grow that faith and expand that faith by listening to his still small voice as he directs us through his word and in his Holy Spirit. Asking Abba what he wants us to do and how he wants us to do the things he instructs us to do. Then follow through with those instructions. So let us trust Abba in every aspect of our day-to-day -day lives, including in our finances. Ouch. Our careers, our relationships, which means that we have to learn to put y'all first in our lives and factor him into everything. Everything we do. Let us make it a habit to ask him about everything we intend to do. I know that sounds a little outlandish, but that's how we start trusting him, putting even the smallest things into his hands, learning to say no on certain things until we hear from Yah and yes to those things that Yah requires of us to do. And as hard as it may be for some of us, let us push ourselves to only think of things from a godly Elohim and positive perspective. So then we have to learn to become hopeless Pollyannas, whereby we replace complaining with thanksgiving and with praise. First Thessalonians chapter five, verses 18 and 19. And let us joyfully and with unshakable hope look forward to the day when we see our master, Yeshua Messiah, face to face, as Paul mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. And then we reflect for all eternity the glory, the radiance of our creator. And let us proclaim to all the world on whatever platforms we have access to and to whatever circles we have influence in the coming kingdom of Yah. Even in our prayers, let us repeat daily the affirmation, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you know, if we invest our time and our efforts in these little things, our faith will grow exponentially over time. And we will enjoy the fullness of Yah's peace, Yah's shalom. Shabbat shalom, beloved. Shavua tov. And for those of you who are observationalists such as me, have a blessed and meaningful Shavuot. Take care.